All right. Hello again. We are uh, going to get into uh, the last half of this lecture. Um, so things we're going to talk about today where we left off, uh, we're going to talk about things that happen to rhythms. So last time we talked about all of our different rhythms, uh, sinus rhythms, atrial rhythms, junctional rhythms, ventricular rhythms, blocks, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So now we're going to talk about some things that you might have seen on the PowerPoint. Um, we're going to talk about things called sinus arrest, uh, sinus pause. Uh, they're not really they're kind of the same, but it's a subcategory. Um, we're going to talk about what's called PACs, premature atrial contractions, PJCs, premature junctional contractions, PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. Uh, we're going to talk about um, something called couplets, triplets, uh, salvos, kind of the same thing. Uh, runs of VTAC, same thing, right? And um, Let's see what else do we got today. By Gemini and Trigemini, we're going to talk about. So that's kind of on the on the agenda today um, in this video. Oh, also six sinus syndrome too. So that's kind of the topics that we're going to cover in this video. Um, once we finish that up, um, the game plan is. Oh, we got to talk about WPW also. Boy, it's just keep on coming. Um, once we finish all that up, we will also um, look at just an introduction to the twelve lead. We're not doing 12 leads. We're not going to get into 12 leads just yet. Um, but the thing about it is, is we have to know what leads look at, what viewpoints of the heart uh, to move forward. OK, so, for example, we're going to talk about identifying WPW today. Um, and there's two different types of WT, WPW, type A, type B. Um, and you have to look in like lead V1, for example, for one of the criteria. but. We haven't really talked about what leads are what, like V1, V2, V3. I mean, you've heard of them, but um, we haven't really talked about what looks at what yet. So we just got to at least be familiar with that, especially moving on to the next module where we have to start talking about um, bundle branch blocks and axis and hypertrophy. We have to be familiar with 12 leads, right? At least what, what leads look at what part of the heart. So we'll talk about that today. And then after that, um, in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to do a review and we're just basically going to cover um, all of the kind of things that we've talked about to get you ready for the first exam. So it'll be all the simple stuff first, like, you know, counting boxes. How many boxes is this amount of time worth? What is up and down measure? What is left and right measure? You know, simple stuff like that. Then all things like, what do the waves mean? Like, what's a P wave mean? What's a QRS mean? What's a T wave mean? Things like that, right? Uh, what should your normal intervals be? Things like that. Uh, and then we'll just do like a big rhythm review. So we'll do kind of like a couple... Um, couple examples of, you know, a normal sinus rhythm, sinus Brady, sinus tack, a flutter, a fib, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth, right? That way, start getting more practice, because I know that we've kind of looked at everything once, um, and that's cool, because, you know, we got to start slow, um, but we got to start looking at more, uh, more rhythms, become more familiar with things, because uh, learning EKGs is just a matter of repetition, okay? You just got to do repetition, repetition. The more you see, uh, the more familiar you become with things and uh, the more you're able to cement it uh, in your head. All right, so let's talk about uh, sinus arrest, sinus pause, as you can see on the screen right now, hopefully. Let me double check that you can see it. You should be able to. All right, so the sinus arrest and a sinus pause is not exactly the same thing per se. Um, basically, you have a sinus I'm sorry, a sinoatrial pause, okay? And that's kind of like an umbrella category. And then you have two types of sinoatrial pauses. You have a sinus block and a sinus arrest. And the sinus arrest is more serious, okay? Um, but either way, neither of them are good because if you look on the screen, and we're gonna get the pen out here one sec. If you look on the screen, Let's just look at what we got. We got a P wave, a QRS, a T, a P wave, a QRS, a T. And then we got a whole lot of nothing right here. And then a P wave, a QRS, and a T. Well, if you were following the same pattern, you should have had like a cardiac cycle somewhere right around there, but we didn't, okay? So like we're missing everything. So what's happening here? So basically the atriums, or the SA node failed to generate a P wave because remember the P wave under normal working circumstances propagates through the atria, through the junction, down to the ventricles, and then initiates a ventricular contraction, which is your QRS. 
So we should have had a P wave here somewhere around there. And we didn't. So the ventricles were sitting there like, all right, well, we just wait for the atriums to tell us what to do, but the atriums didn't tell us what to do. So we didn't do anything. Okay. That's kind of what's going on here to simplify it. So um, when you have a brief moment of almost, I guess you could say asystole for like a second, um, we would say that that is a sinus pause. Now, what type of sinus pause it is, it just depends on whether it uh, marches out, as we say, um, and we'll explain that in like two seconds. So, well, let's see what else can I say about this. It's just something to be aware of, guys, clinically. Um, if you have like one of these, your patient, well, hopefully your patient, not you, uh, has one of these, um, it's not the end of the world, okay? Um, but if they continue to happen, that can definitely be a sign of uh, uh, unhealthy or a sick SA node. And you gotta remember, like this is not a long time, but it's you're not perfusing very much at all during this period. So uh, it doesn't take more than a couple of seconds, a lack of blood flow to the brain uh, to start causing altered mental status and uh, syncopal episodes and unconsciousness, okay? So just kind of be aware of that. Like if you have a one-off, then I don't like it, but if you start having a bunch of them, I really don't like it, okay? So I'm just gonna switch this here real quick to the whiteboard. Oh, bear with me, I'm sorry. I know we move at a fast pace in this world, but I'm doing the best I can here. So um, when it comes to sinus pauses, like I said, you have a sinus block and then a sinus arrest, okay? So if you were to have a P, a QRS, and a T, a P and a QRS, and a T, a whole lot of nothing, a P, a QRS, and a T, okay? Basically, what we're looking at is that when we had a period like that, okay, did we have, when it picked back up again, did it pick back up again on time, or did it not pick back up again on time, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's what that means. So if you have um, a sinus block, okay, it's going to pick back up on time. And if you have a sinus arrest, which is worse, it's not going to pick back up on time. Okay. Um, so if you was to march things out, what I mean by marching out is, is if you took a piece of paper and every time you had a, oops, and hold on, I lost my whiteboard, clicked something. Uh oh, I think I broke it. We're gonna redo this here. My computer's acting a little crazy. Share the whiteboard. There we go. All right. Uh, so if you was to look at QRSs, right? And if that was a QRS, and that was a QRS, and that was a QRS, and that was a QRS, what you could do to, when we say march something out is, is you could take a piece of paper and you just mark on a piece of paper where the QRSs touch the paper. If you help the paper like, like that to the strip, okay? So um, if the paper is like, okay, I got a QRS here, I got a QRS here, I got a QRS here, I got a QRS here. And then if you move the paper over, you can basically uh, assume that you should have one here, you should have one here, you should have one here, you should have one here because it should follow the same pattern, okay? So if you did have um, like a long strip of a whole bunch of complexes and they continued to march out as we say, with the same type of a pattern, okay? That's what we mean by marching out. It's kind of hard to draw on a computer or explain on a computer, um, but it basically means that they're following the same pattern, okay? If something all of a sudden deviates from a pattern, okay, then it would not march out as we say, all right? So that's what we mean by that, all right? So when you have a sinus, uh, let's see, which one are we doing? Sinus block, okay. You're gonna wanna march out from here on out like that, where you think the pattern should fall if it was following the same regularity or the same pattern, okay? 
So let's go to actually look at it. I just wanted to kind of give you the explanation. If you're a little confused, it'll make sense probably a little bit more here in two seconds. Uh, but I just wanted to like introduce you to the concept of what I meant by marching out. All right, so here we have a sinus block, okay? So as you can see, let me get my pen. As you can see, when we march out where this P, well, let's back up a sec, I'm sorry. Let's just back up. Let's identify what we got. P wave, QRST, whole lot of nothing. P wave, QRST, P wave, QRST, okay? Now, some people might say like, okay, well, why isn't this a block? Well, what do you mean by a block? Like this might, they, they might say, well, why isn't this like a second degree type one, second degree type two, third degree, whatever, like a, a AV block, right? Some people might, might ask that question, which is a fine question. But remember to have a block, like as in a second degree type one or two or a third degree, you have to have non-conductive P waves, non-conductive P waves to make it a block. We don't have any non-conductive P waves here. In fact, we have nothing, okay? So the fact that we have, because um, remember a cardiac complex or a cardiac cycle, one complete cardiac cycle is a P, a QRS and a T. Well, we should have a P, we should have a QRS, we should have a T like somewhere right around there, but we don't. So because we don't have anything, we don't have a P wave that failed to propagate and create a QRS, we dropped an entire complex. So when you drop an entire complex, we call that a uh, sinus pause, okay? And then it just depends whether it's a sinus block or a sinus arrest. In this case, now that we've labeled everything, let's march everything out. Here's your P and here should be your next P and here should be your next P, right? So because this one picks back up on the same timing pattern here, okay? We would say that that is a sinus block. All right, that's what we mean by that. If you told me it's a sinus pause, I'd be perfectly happy with that too. So let's look at what we got here. So first things first, let's kind of look at stuff. We got P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, whole lot of nothing. So it looks like we dropped an entire complex, right? And then we have a P, a Q, R, S, T, so on and so forth, okay? So we know we have a sinus pause of some kind. We just don't know, is this a sinus block or is it a sinus arrest, okay? So we just march everything out the same distance from every P to every P to every P to every P like that, okay? So as you could see, same distance, same distance, same distance, same, okay, we should have had one right here. We should have had one right here and we should have one right here, which we do. So because it picks back up on time again, it follows the same timing pattern, we call that a sinus block. If it didn't, it would be a sinus arrest. which is what we're looking at now. So you have the P, I mean, you can label everything here. You see what's going on. We have a, a missing cardiac cycle or complex. Okay, so we know it's a sinus pause of some kind. So let's march it all out. So the P is here. It should be another one here. And it should be another one here. Okay, so because we don't have it resuming on time, um, that's a sinus arrest. Okay, that's all, that's only the difference. That's the only difference there. So these are a little bit worse, okay? Because it just signals a higher level of dysfunction in the SA node. So as you can see, we know we have a sinus pause because we're missing some complexes. So we can march it all out from here to here, here to here, here to here, 
And if we march it out one more time, our P wave should have been right here. Should have been right here. But it wasn't. It was a little bit before that. So because this is a little bit off, it's a sinus arrest. Okay. So that's just the difference between the two things. But ultimately, they're both uh, sinus pauses. Okay. So that's the big key to be able to identify um, that it is a sinus pause um, and that there is some SA node uh, dysfunction. That's, that's the big thing. Okay. All right, so let's move back to what we were doing. So that pretty much sums up that. So sick sinus syndrome. Sick sinus syndrome is pretty simple, okay? It's just alternating um, rates between basically things going slow and things going fast and fast and then slow again and just back and forth and just all over the place, okay? So some people will call it a tachycardia bradycardia syndrome because that is exactly what's happening here. You're tachycardic for a little bit and then you're bradycardic for a little bit and then you're tachycardic and it just kind of goes back and forth, all right? Um, and it's not like you're getting up and down and you're climbing stairs, which is causing this. Like you'd just be sitting on the couch, laying in bed, doing whatever, and your heart rate's just going fast, going slow back and forth for no reason, all right? Um, basically what this is um, indicative of is, <laughs> I love the name, sick sinus syndrome, because it couldn't be a better explanation. Your sinus SA node is basically sick. It is not functioning properly. And it's confused as to what its rate is supposed to be. And sometimes it's going fast, sometimes it's going slow. Um, so uh, so that, that's basically sick sinus syndrome. Pretty simple to identify when you see alternating patterns of bradycardia and tachycardia. That's it, okay? We'll get another example here real quick. So yeah, look, like, let's see what we got here. It's like you got a little bit of tachycardia here. It's like rates like right at 100. And then you almost have like a sinus pause here. And then you got a couple complexes. And then you got a whole not, lot of nothing right there, right? So you might say, well, that looks like a sinus pause to me. Well, I would agree to you. Um, so sometimes your sick sinus syndromes include like sinus block, sinus arrests, things like that, okay? But as you can see, um, we're just basically going from fast to slow. Well, it's not really slow, but uh, faster, slower, <laughs> slow as in nothing at all, right? Um, and then fast again, just back and forth. That's really, um, really what we're looking at here. So that would be sick sinus syndrome, okay? All right, so let's talk about PACs, PJCs, PBCs, all of those things uh whiteboard and whiteboard there we go all right so if you were to have a it's all about timing okay it's all about timing so if you got a guy that looks like this pretend they look the same Use your imagination. But then what if you had a guy like this? So let's look at the timing pattern here, right? So you got a QRS here, a QRS here, a QRS here. That is, let's say, that's the rhythm we're going to say, the, um, the timing, the timing of it, okay? So the strip below it, let's look at what we have. So this lines up, that lines up, that doesn't line up, and then that's over here. So their timing pattern from the bottom strip compared to the top strip got off somehow, okay? Well, how did that happen? Right, because the distance between this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy are kind of the same, right? But the distance between these two guys are not the same. So what what's going on here? That's the question, okay? So what happened is, is that remember the P wave creates in a rough sense the QRS because the ventricles are waiting for that signal from the atrium. So you have a P wave here and then the ventricles are like, okay, cool. I see a P wave. I'm going to do my QRS thing. 
and that's what you get. And then you have a P wave here, and then the ventricles are like, okay, cool, I see a P wave, I'm gonna do my thing, boom. But then you had a P wave here, right? Well, why did we, what, what do we notice? We had a P wave earlier than we should have, right? Because the time between this P wave and, I'm sorry, between that T wave and that P wave is that. And the time between that T wave and that P wave is that. So that should be like the normal timing pattern between how much time it takes from the end of a T wave to the beginning of the next P wave. But this right here, T wave to P wave was only that amount of time. So what we're looking at here is, is that the SA node, the atrium fired too quickly in the timing pattern. It was a premature, atrial contraction. It's all in the name, right? So what we're looking at here is, is that for whatever reason in this uh, cycle, if we were to draw out a whole bunch of rhythm or a whole bunch of cardiac cycles for a long strip, uh, you would see that basically everything was probably normal, except in this one instance right here, we had a moment of irregularity because um, the P wave fired too quickly it didn't wait long enough after the T wave. And then consequently a QRS followed it. So it created a heartbeat a little bit sooner than it should have in the whole timing pattern. So that's the concept behind all of this. So here's what I will tell you. Okay, when you get PACs, PJCs, BBCs, things like that. Um, if you get like one of them, like I'm just giving you an example. There's not like a hard rule on this, okay? But I'm just giving you an example. If you had like a hundred beats, and you looked at 100 beats over the course of like a minute or whatever, and you saw one PAC in that, at that moment, you would technically have a moment of irregularity, okay? Because the uh, ventricle contracted a little bit sooner than it should have, and it created an irregular R to R interval, all right? So if you had 100 beats and you had one PAC, I would not say that that's an irregular rhythm. I would see that I would say that it is a regular rhythm that had a moment of irregularity because of a PAC. Okay, so that's just how I would look at that. All right, so that's a PAC. Okay, now sometimes and this gets a little tricky, guys. I'm sorry, life's tough, you know. Um, you get something that looks like this, and that's like a T wave, and then you get like that, and that's a T wave. And then you get something like that. Suspense is building, I know. Oops, I messed it up. <laughs> I made you wait all that time for nothing. So sometimes what will happen in a PAC, because as you can see here, what do we got? P, uh, P wave, QRS, T, P wave, QRS, T, but a funny looking T, right? I intentionally drew this T wave to be bigger than this T wave, just so we're on the same page here. And it looks like we don't have a P wave here, right? I don't see one. And then you have a QRS and then a T, okay? So, Kind of weird so sometimes what will happen guys and this is another example of a pac is that your r to r like these were your two normal beat normal cycles like this was a normal cycle and that was a normal cycle okay and that's your abnormal cycle oops so my R to R from here is like that. And that's what it's supposed to be if we drew this whole thing out. And then my T to P segment should be like that long. Well, my R to R got a lot shorter here. And honestly, I don't even look like I have a P wave here, okay? So sometimes what'll happen, and you gotta be really careful about this, is that when you get this premature beat right here, and you're not entirely sure what it is, 
sometimes that P wave will actually get buried in the T wave. In other words, they happened at the same time. So this ventricle here repolarized and the atrium depolarized at the same time. And you're looking at a measure of amplitude. So if you add two electricities together, you're gonna get more amplitude, okay? So sometimes what'll happen is, is if you're unsure, is, is this a PAC or a PJC or whatever the case may be, look at that preceding T wave right before the beat that happened, because that's the beat that happened too quick. Look at that T wave and say, hey, does this T wave look like ever, every other T wave? Or is this T wave marginally bigger than every other T wave? If it looks like every other T wave, well, then it's probably just like every other T wave. But if it's a good bit bigger than every other T wave, um, then you probably have a P wave that got buried inside of it because it happened at the same time. So that would be a PAC still. Um, some people confuse PACs that have P waves buried in T waves as PJCs, which we're gonna talk about here shortly. Um, at the end of the day, guys, if you mistake something for a PAC or a PJC, it is not the end of the world. It's really not going to affect your clinical judgment making on a patient. So don't like full hairs over something like that. Yes, we should always get things correct. Absolutely. Uh, but clinically, uh, if you mistake it, it's not going to be detrimental to the patient. Okay. So let's talk about what a PJC is. So remember, when something comes from the atrium, it creates a P wave. But when an electrical impulse comes from the junction, it can present as either an absent P wave or an inverted P wave or a retrograde P wave after the QRS. So what if I said, this is our rhythm. And I, just so we're all clear guys, I know I can't draw. We're gonna say that these are all narrow complexes, okay? So what do we got here? We got a P, a QRS, a T, a P, a QRS, a T, and then we have something that happened too soon because this should have happened like, we should have had a QRS like around here, but instead we have one like here, okay? So something happened too soon in the timing pattern, all right? So I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, well, do I have a P wave? You know, because if I have a P wave right here, well, that probably was a PAC then, right? Because it happened too quickly, but I don't have a P wave. And my T wave is not marginally bigger than any of the other T waves we're going to say. So it's not a PAC because I don't have a P wave and I don't have a preceding T wave that's marginally bigger. So if it's narrow, and it has no P wave, we're going to call that a junctional beat, okay? Because that's what junctional beats look like. Junctional beats are narrow, and they don't have P waves, or they have inverted P waves. In this particular case, this is a premature junctional contraction. So how do we know it's a premature junctional contraction? Because it's narrow, and it doesn't have a P wave, or it would have an inverted one and it happened too soon or out of order too quickly in the timing pattern of this R to R to R to R to R to R thing, okay? So that's pretty much a, a premature junctional contraction, okay? So a premature ventricular contraction, remember we said when you have ventricles contracting, you have uh, a wide QRS. So if you had a narrow QRS, and then a PVC, narrow QRS, PVC, so on and so forth, right? I mean, this is grossly exaggerated, but when we see it on some strips, it'll make sense. We're just explaining it for right now. So when you have a PVC, the hallmark of a PVC is a wide QRS, okay? So it's a wide QRS and following the same theme is it happened before it should have. So if you have like a normal beat, normal beat, and then all of a sudden this thing, 
and then a normal beat, right? Well, what happened, okay? So this was our timing pattern from R to R, okay? So our next R should have been like, I don't know, like right there or something like that. So what do we got? P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, and then we have this ugly thing. Well, what you're looking at here is that the ventricles, right after they depolar, I'm sorry, right after they repolarized here, they depolarized again way too soon. In fact, they depolarized themselves before the atriums ever did anything. So you don't even have a P wave, okay? As ventricles popped off before it was their time. All right, so um, we're gonna call that a premature ventricular contraction. And what's the hallmark of a premature ventricular contraction? Well, something happened too soon in the timing pattern, of course, but it's gonna be a wide QRS. That's the key, it's gonna be a wide QRS. Now, depending on where electricity originates from, right? If you have a ventricle, which is clearly not an anatomical drawing, don't hate me, okay? But if you had a ventricle that looked like that, and then one PVC originated from here in the ventricle, that PVC might look like that. Well, if that, if another uh, electrical impulse originated from over here in the ventricle, it might look like that, okay? So, so on and so forth, okay? So whenever electricity originates in a different place, uh, it's gonna have a different morphology. That kind of goes back to the wandering atrial pacemaker thing we talked about. Remember how a wandering atrial pacemaker had three or more different P wave morphologies, right? Well, why do they have different morphologies? Okay, because if the electricity in the atrium originated here, your P wave might look like that. If it originated here, your P wave might look like that. And if it was like here, it might look like that. Okay, so when electricity comes from a different place, it looks different on the EKG, like there's a different morphology to it. Uh, and why are we talking about that? Because QRSs from PVCs. Well, PVCs will have multiple different morphologies sometimes, okay? So what I'm gonna tell you guys, and I don't think this is in your PowerPoint, but it's important to know, is that if you have a strip, and I'm, we're just gonna simplify things, and you got a normal beat, normal beat, and then you got a PVC that looks like that, and a normal beat, and then, Let's just for sake argument say right here, we had another, oh, goodness gracious. All right, so P wave QRST, P wave QRST, PVC. You might look at this thing and go, well, what's going on here? It's super common to have a um, T wave that has the opposite deflection of a QRS and a PVC. So if you have a positive deflection on a PVC, it's very common to have a negative deflection on a T wave. If you have a negative deflection on the PVC, it's very common to have a positive deflection on the, on the following T wave, which is kind of how they, how they look. Then we have a normal beat here, and then we have another PVC here, okay? So what I'm gonna tell you guys is, is that if you have PVCs that have the same morphology in a strip, in other words, all the PVCs have the same shape, we call that unifocal PVCs, uni one, right? If you had um, something that was like, So normal beat, normal beat, normal beat, right? And we got a PVC here and a PVC here, okay? So notice what we, what do we notice? That they have different morphologies, different shapes, okay? So if you have PVCs that have the same shape, unifocal, if you have PVCs that have more than one shape, we call that multifocal, multifocal PVCs. So uh, electricity is originating in different parts of the um, ventricles to create these. Okay, so that's PVCs, unifocal, multifocal. Now, 
when you have two PVCs in a row, So normal beat, normal beat, normal beat, PVC, PVC, right? So we had two PVCs in a row, same shape, so unifocal PVCs, right? And when you have two in a row, we call that a couplet, okay? A couplet. So what is a couple? A couple is two, so you have a couplet. A lot of people confuse, guys, couplets and bigeminy. Please don't make that mistake. I, I see why people make that mistake, but please don't make that mistake. Over the years, I've seen a lot of silly mistakes on tests um and just getting like easy questions wrong because you weren't like thinking right so a couplet is two in a row that are connected they have to be connected to one another holding hands okay so if you have a normal b pvc normal b pvc normal b PVC, so on and so forth. So when every other beat, so normal beat, PVC, normal beat, PVC, normal beat, PVC. When every other beat is a PVC, we call that by Gemini, by Gemini, by Gemini. Okay. So two in a row. This is not by Gemini. This is a couplet. This thing up top here is by Gemini. Okay. All right. So what if we had oh, prolonged QT interval? That was a joke. All right. So what do we got here? We got normal beat, normal beat, PVC, 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 normal beat, right? My normal beats really are terrible. They're like wider than the PVCs. We're going to need to work on this. These are narrow complexes right here, guys. Narrow complexes. I promise to try harder. All right. So when you have three PVCs in a row, there's a couple different names for this. Some people will call it a triplet, not very commonly used. Some people will call it a salvo. Never heard it once used in my entire life outside of textbooks. Um, but what people are going to call this and what it is, and this is why it's important, is because that once you have three PVCs in a row, we call that a run of ventricular tachycardia. So people will say you have a run of VTAC. So why do we care about three PVCs in a row or more? Because it's not just three guys, it's three or more. So it could be three, four, five, 10, 20, right? But if it goes back, to like a normal rhythm from having a bunch of PVCs in a row, three or more, we would say that that person went into a run of VTAC. And why is that important? Well, because we don't want people, you're not supposed to be in VTAC, it's not a good thing, okay? So that means a person who has one PVC, whatever, I can get over it. Person who has two PVCs in a row, a couplet, eh, well, I don't like it, but I can get over it. A person who starts having two PVCs in a row over and over and over again, nah, I don't like that. A person who starts having a run of VTAC, Mm, I'm definitely going to keep an eye on you. Person who starts having multiple runs of VTAC, well, multiple runs of VTAC generally just devolve into full on VTAC. Okay. So that's why you need to keep an eye on these people. All right. Uh, if I have a person who has one PVC, I'm absolutely not freaking out about it. It's not terribly abnormal. Um, it's just when you start getting um, symptoms from them um, and when you start getting like multiple PVCs like more than six, more than 10 a minute. And that's definitely becoming a, an issue. Uh, multifocal are generally a little worse than unifocal, I think. Um, start going into runs of VTAC, especially more than one run of VTAC, then we start to worry about things. Just another thing to kind of throw out there for you guys, just clinical pearl for you. Um, PVCs can be perfusing or not perfusing, all right? So uh, what do I mean by that? So I mean that they can create a pulse or they cannot create a pulse. So just to give you an example is,
Okay. So let's look at what we got. Normal. BBC. Normal. BBC. Normal. BBC. Normal. BBC. Okay. So we've already talked about this, what this is. So when every other beat is a BBC, we call that by Gemini, right? So this, this is by Gemini. So what I mean by not perfusing, I'm gonna give you an example and I'm gonna tell you why this matters, okay? So I have a patient, this was many years ago, but I always thought I was just very interesting, you know, and it's a good, it's good teaching. Like it's a good, it was a good uh, patient for teaching purposes, right? So we have a patient, 60 something year old lady uh, laying on the floor of a hotel lobby, right? And she like had like a syncopal episode and, um, family called 911. She woke up right away and she wanted to stand up. And every time she would like sit up or stand up, she'd basically like almost pass out again. Right. So she was just laying on the floor because she felt better like that. So we get there, we do all the things we do, we put her on the monitor and she's in this by Gemini rhythm, kind of like what I've drawn out. So uh, if you do her heart rate, her heart rate is 60. It says 60 on the monitor. Okay. You look at the little numbers up here. It's like heart rate, O2 sat, you know, respirations and title, if you really want it, like who cares, right? You got all these numbers. So our heart rate is like 60 looking at the monitor and we're talking to her, we're doing our assessment, all the things we do. So I reached out and I take a pulse on this lady, a, a, a radial pulse, and she doesn't have a radial pulse at all, which means her blood pressure is kind of low. Okay. Probably below 90 or maybe below 80, depending on the book you read. So when we're getting our vitals, we do our blood pressure. Blood pressure is like 70 over, I don't know, something. Okay. So that's low, concerning, definitely. So I'm like, well, that's interesting. She doesn't have a radio pulse. So I take a carotid pulse. And absolutely, sure enough, her carotid pulse was 30. Okay. I actually had a student with me um, on this call, and I thought it was really good for them to learn. So, which was really interesting because her heart rate on the monitor electrically is 60, but these PVCs were not perfusing PVCs, none of them. So because of that, well, what's her real heart rate then? If only none of these PVCs are creating a pulse, then our real heart rate is actually 30, okay? So that's just something to keep in mind as to why a person uh, in Bigemini um, may or may not be uh, problematic for you. They could very well be perfusing PVCs or they could very well not be perfusing PVCs. This goes back to what we always say, treat your patient, not the monitor. I always say treat both, okay? You can't just rely on this stuff. You gotta put your hands on your patients. So that's why it matters. All right, so you guys will be able to guess this one. I hope so. If not, that's okay too. probably hate me right now no I'm sorry BBC normal beat normal beat BBC normal beat normal beat PVC okay so let's just say for the sake of argument we had a PVC over here so we got PVC here, normal beat, normal beat, PVC, normal beat, normal beat, PVC, normal beat, normal beat, PVC. So we have a PVC every third beat, okay? So whereas if we had a PVC every second beat, that's bigemini, a PVC every third beat, that's trigemini, tri being three, okay? That's all. So you got bigemini and you got trigemini. One is every other beat, every two beats, one is every three beats, okay? So we talked about PVCs, we talked about um, unifocal, multifocal, we talked about runs of ETAC, couplets, okay? Don't confuse couplets and bigemini. Um, and we talked about trigemini, so that's pretty much it for that, okay? So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So now we just need to talk about something called WPW, Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome.
Oh, we got to talk about pacemakers too. I guess we can talk about cardioversion. All right. So Brugada is a thing, but we're going to get into Brugada. We're going to talk about Brugada, guys, when we talk about 12 leads and we talk about uh, ischemia and things like that, because you got to really know how to look at a 12 lead to understand Brugada. And we haven't looked at 12 leads yet. So we're going to hold off on Brugada for right now. Uh, but what we will do is look at WPW and pacemakers and um we'll just explain what cardioversion is real quick all right so let me find the wpw well that's terrible all right this is very difficult to draw this is probably difficult to draw for somebody who can draw and i can't draw so it's really tough for me all right so let's do our best to draw a normal B or two. P wave, I'm gonna really try. Hey, look at that. That was not bad. Oh, my T wave should have been a little bit bigger. All right, another one. Well, oh, that got too wide again. Okay, so on and so forth, right? So what if I drew something that looks like this? Got a P wave in a very short PR interval. And you don't even really have a Q, because remember the downward part right there is the Q. It just kind of goes like P wave, and then it does like a slope upwards like that into the QRS, and then a T wave. And it kind of looks like that. So you have a P wave, a really short PR interval, and that P almost goes like right into this rapid upslope, brief upslope, okay? And it's like almost like this slurred R wave that, that goes up like that, okay? So that is what we call a delta wave, all right? So this rapid upslope, brief upslope of the R wave and a short PR interval is called a delta wave. Okay, delta waves are associated with uh, WPW. They're pretty much pathognomonic for it. Okay, so what's happening here? All right, so remember we have the SA node and you got the AV and then you got the ventricles down here, right? And normally the SA node pumps out their electrical signals through these internodal pathways. They get to the AV. The purpose of the AV is to slow down that signal just a brief moment to allow the ventricles time to fill and then things go down here. Well, what happens in WPW is that people have an accessory pathway. In other words, they have an extra electrical pathway that they're not supposed to have. In other words, they have a road and that road detours and it completely bypasses the AV down to the ventricles. So some of these signals might come down here and some of these signals might come down here. Now, a lot of these um, accessory pathways called the bundle of Kent, okay, um, they can actually be bidirectional. So electricity can go downwards and then it can go back upwards again and then create, uh, well, it can go downwards, stimulate the ventricles, or it can go downwards and upwards and then stimulate the SA to contract even more because now this electrical uh, electricity that's coming back upwards is stimulating the atriums now. Uh, it gets really like wacky. Um, so that can get, that can be problematic. Okay. So um, it depends where the accessory pathway is. If it runs from the SA down to the left ventricle, we call that WPW type A. But if it runs down the right ventricle, we would call it WPW type B. Okay. And they just look a little bit different on the EKG as far as what leads do what. Um, but at the end of the day, they all have short PR interval, they have a delta wave, and because they have this delta wave, it's going to create a wide QRS, okay? So if you ask me, like, what's the hallmark of WBW and EKG, in, like, simplified form, I would say short PR interval, delta wave, wide QRS, okay? That's pretty much what it is. Why do we care about WPW? Well, a couple things. 
because we have this electrical accessory pathway where electricity can go from the SA directly to the ventricles, bypassing the AV, um, these people are going to be more prone to what we call tachyarrhythmias. So they're more prone to going into things like uh, SVTs, things like AFib, RVRs, things of that nature. And that can be problematic, right? What I will tell you is, is that people don't go in and out of WPW. They live in it. It's always going to be there on their EKG. So that doesn't mean it's always going to have a problem, okay? In fact, rarely will it have a problem. Uh, you might meet some people that are 25, 30 years old, you do an EKG and it's a completely incidental finding and they've never had a problem from it. It doesn't mean they won't. That doesn't mean they won't. In fact, they're more prone than a regular person to, um, but it's not always problematic, but it definitely can be. So, um, so like, why do we care about this? Because they're more prone to tachyarrhythmias. Okay. And when electricity propagates down that bundle of Kent, it doesn't hit that speed bump, which is the AV junction, and it doesn't slow everything down, which um, can become, a, become an issue. Now, um, this is a little bit dangerous too when it comes to diagnosing, because if you have a patient, and you gotta be careful when you're out there, if you have a patient uh, that's in like, I don't know, SVT for example, and, um, you don't catch that they're in WPW, you don't see it, you just think it's regular old SVT, and you give a AV nodal blocking agent, like adenosine, for example, you're gonna block completely all of this, briefly. So what happens now? The electricity has no choice but to go down the faster pathway. And in, in essence, you run the risk most likely of making things significantly worse. Because if their heart rate's already fast and we give a SA, I'm sorry, AV nodal blocking agent, that can doesn't necessarily have to be adenosine. It can also be calcium channel blockers too. So things like cardizem, verapamil, whatever. Um, you go blocking that AV node, AV junction, um, you're liable to make the situation much worse. Okay. So um, that's just why that's important and why it's clinically relevant. So that is WPW in a nutshell. Um, just know for now, I know you're probably like a little unclear on it, um, but just know for now, WPW has a delta wave and a short PR interval wide QRS. That's the, that's the hallmark of it. We're gonna see it again at the end of this PowerPoint. Um, and once you see a couple of them, it'll make more sense. So let's see, cardioversion, electrical cardioversion. So uh, I don't you know, know where you guys are in your curriculum. Uh, you probably, probably have not taken ACLS yet, um, and that's perfectly fine. So I'll just kind of give you a short version of things. Uh, sometimes when people get extremely fast heart rates, so in case of like AFib or VR, um, and they're not in a position where we can pharmacologically manage them because maybe they're hemodynamically unstable, um, we're forced to uh, manage them through electrical therapy, and we call that electrical cardioversion. So somebody who's in like maybe an SVT or AFib or VR or VTAC and their heart rate's like really, really fast, their blood pressure is really, really low. Uh, we need to fix this problem like right now, right? Um, so what we do is, is that uh, we synchronize the monitor. Give me one second here. Oops. Hold on. I think I broke it again. These work. There we go. So if a person was in like AFib or VR and we needed to cardiovert them to fix them, we would press a button on the monitor called synchronize or sync S Y N C. And it would line up, create these arrows on all the R waves. And then when you press that, charge button and then that shock button it's going to deliver that electricity right on that r wave it has to be at the right spot okay um so as you can see right here when you deliver electricity remember we're measuring electricity on an ekg so when you shock somebody on an ekg you're going to see this huge like spike that's taller than anything else on the paper like that very quickly uh and you're just looking at um, the electricity that was delivered to the patient and you're seeing it on the EKG, 
Okay, so what we had here was a person who is in AFib RVR going kind of pretty fast. Don't know what was going on with them, but they needed to be cardioverted for whatever the reason. They were cardioverted right here. And, you know, depending on, you know, they were probably cardioverted at somewhere between 120 and 200 joules. You don't need to know that for this course. Uh, when you take ACLS, you'll learn all that. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of a good little, it's a good little zap, right? Um, you'll be sore for a day afterwards after this. So, um, and then you see the electrical um, tracing right here. And then notice what happened after they cardioverted them. We went from AFib to a perfectly normal sinus rhythm. So that's actually pretty cool. So that person um, was kind of sort of fixed in a way. Person who goes in to AFib many, many times, um, they might need medical management or even, I think, as they say, the definitive management is uh, an ablation, right? But I have no idea. This is just a strip. I have no idea what's wrong with the patient, so I can't really surmise or speculate. All right, so I think that covers it, maybe. Let me see here. Oh, pacemaker, right. Aha, where are you at? Eh, that's terrible. But it's hard to see, but we'll work with what we got. So a person who has a pacemaker, you may have heard of that before, like, oh, grandma's got a pacemaker, right? So what's happening here is, is that for whatever reason, there's SA node dysfunction, AV node dysfunction. The ventricles are confused as to when they need to be, right? Um, so we will install a pacemaker in them and it will basically act as the SA node. So it will create an electrical impulse at rhythmic intervals, which stimulates the ventricles to contract. So basically what you see, let me get a different color. What you see, this, see this line right here that goes downwards from the baseline, it's hard to see. That's a line, the black line right there. It's hard to see on this strip, but that is actually what we call a pacer spike. So that's the term we use for that, a pacer spike. So that's electricity being provided by the pacemaker. And if the pacemaker is working properly, then you will have pacemaker spike and then a ventricular contraction. Pacemaker spike, ventricular contraction. Pacemaker spike, ventricular contraction. Pacemaker spike, ventricular contraction, like that, right? So when you see pacer spikes on an EKG, and remember, a pacer spike is going to cause the ventricles to contract. Well, when the ventricles contract kind of sort of on their own, it's going to be a ventricular contraction. It's going to be a wide complex. So because of that, when you see paced rhythms, generally they're going to be wide complex, okay? Now, there's different types of pacemakers out there. Some are like permanently on, like they're always working. Like every single beat has a pacer spike. And then some of them are what we call on-demand pacers. So they can program these things and they monitor your heart rate. And it might be like, I don't know, I'm just making up numbers here, right? But it might be like, if the patient's heart rate falls below 50 or 60, then it turns on and it starts pacing them. And once they get back to like a normal rate and then they're doing it on their own, the pacemaker will turn off. But the pacemaker will turn back on again whenever their heart rate falls below a set point, okay? So that would be an example of what we call an on-demand pacemaker. Now, you have dual chamber pacemakers. So what we just talked about was atrial pacers, right? Or I'm sorry, ventricular pacers, I'm losing my mind. Uh, ventricular pacers. All right, now you actually have a dual chamber pacemaker. So as you can see here, you got pacers, pacer spike right here, pacer spike right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, right like that, okay? So basically you have this pacer spike and what did it do? Stimulated the atrium. When the atrium got stimulated, what did they do? They created a P wave. And then you got a pacer spike right here and it stimulated the ventricles. And what did they do? They created a QRS. And then you kind of just keep going from there. So this thing is only working here and here, 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 but not here and here. So it looks like it's on demand because it's not always firing. So <clears throat> that's just the difference. If it's a regular pacemaker, it's just a ventricular pacer. If it's a dual pace, dual chamber 
they call them dual chamber pacer makers. Uh, it stimulates the atrium and the ventricles with the pacer spike. And remember the ventricles will still be a wide QRS, okay? So that's pretty much it for that. Uh, let me double check here, see where we're at. So we pretty much covered all the rhythms. We covered all the things that happen to a rhythm. And we're gonna create a video just to look at the 12 lead. And because I wanna keep things kind of at least somewhat organized. Oh, ectopic beat, right? I just wanna, this is just a terminology thing, guys. So this is just terminology. It's not uh, anything that you don't already know. So um, when we say an ectopic beat, we basically mean an electrical impulse um, that is coming from somewhere other than where it is supposed to be coming from. Okay, it's coming from outside of the normal pattern. It's like if you had a uh, band or a orchestra, or a symphony, whatever they call it, of like 100 people playing musical instruments, and then all of a sudden, like one person played like a note that was completely wrong from the other 99 people, like that would be an ectopic beat, okay? Um, so when you have uh, like a PVC, for example, okay? So let me find my pen. 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 There we go. So, as you can see here, this is cool, cool. Well, let's take our time. What do we got? P wave, QRS, T. P wave, QRS, T. Uh oh, we have a QRS that's wide with no P wave. I Meaning we call that, we call that a PVC, right? And then you have P wave, QRS, T. P wave, QRS, T. And Oh, this is interesting. So let me clear this stuff I'm drawing here. So this beat here is too soon in the timing pattern because that's the normal pattern. That was too soon because of a uh, PVC, right? That's the normal pattern. Guys, after you have a PVC, sometimes you have a little bit longer of a time between the next beat. And they call that a compensatory pause. Basically, the heart is trying to kind of figure out what happened and get itself uh, back on the right timing again. Okay. So this is the normal pattern here, normal timing pattern. That's a normal timing pattern. But this was too fast. There's not enough time in between this beat and this beat. So that means that this beat here happened too soon in the timing pattern. Well, if it happened too soon, it could be a PAC, a PJC, a PVC, right? Well, I know it's not a PVC because it's not wide, okay? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna look to see if I have a P wave, which I do, I have a P wave right there. If I didn't have a P wave, I'd say it's a PJC, but I do have a P wave because my T to P interval should be like that. My T to P interval should be like that. My T to P interval should be like that. But now my T to P interval is like that. So my T to P interval, is too short. So what happened here? We had an ectopic beat. Okay, we had something that originated when it wasn't supposed to, and it created a PAC because the atrium fired too soon right here. The ventricle just followed suit and was like, okay, well, I'm going to fire too. Okay, and it threw off the timing pattern. So you had a premature cardiac cycle that was caused by a PAC right here. And here you had a premature beat that was caused by a PVC. Why is this a PVC? Because there's no P wave and it's wide complex. Why is this a PAC? Because there is a P wave that happened too soon and you have an arrow complex. Okay, all right, so that's pretty much like topic beats. It's just terminology. It's not like a, not like a, uh, it, its own beat, you know? All right, so I think that pretty much sums up uh, this video, guys. Um, so we're doing pretty good so far. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is um, 12 leads. And uh, just for right now, we're just going to look at what 
what the leads mean like what are we doing like what is all this stuff like you got all this get all this stuff going on here and this stuff going on here and this stuff looks different than that stuff and that looks different than that and what the heck is going on right so we'll talk about all that in the next one no worries we got you all right until next time guys